day. Amen. Hey, amen. You may be seated. My, well, give the Lord a clap praise this morning on your way down. What an incredible time of worship. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to take your copy of God's Word. Turn with me to the book of Mark. The book of Mark, I want us to look at chapter 2 this morning. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, as we continue on in our sermon series entitled Read 66. Ladies and gentlemen, we are traveling through the Bible. And as we preach the Bible from cover to cover, as we teach the Bible from cover to cover, literally as we read together, the Bible from cover to cover, we're unfolding the unparalleled and unprecedented truths of the Word of God. We're allowing them to permeate who we are and, and literally move us, move from the outside in and the inside out. Ladies and gentlemen, you like that old Route 66, a care person from east to west? We're riding Route 66, and we're not going east to west. We're moving from death unto life. I said death unto life. Make no mistake about it this morning. The Bible takes us from death unto life. Just like Ezekiel out in the valley of dry bones and, and God said to Ezekiel, preach the word of God. Tell him thus saith the Lord God. And those bones became an exceedingly great army. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible takes us from death unto life. Mark chapter 2 beginning in verse 1, going down to verse 12 this morning as we give thought to a sermon that I've simply entitled, Seeing Faith. Seeing Faith. Now, while you're turning to Mark chapter 2, I think it's important this morning to outline the fact that we have been talking a lot about faith. I mean, it's really where God has directed our attention, and I think it's okay I, I think that we get a pass when it comes to talking about faith because faith is very important in our lives. It's very important for our spiritual life. It's the substance of everything that, that we are, spiritually speaking. I mean, it's all about faith. I, I told you last time that we met, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about faith, and I said faith. One, I told you what it was. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Freeman translation, believing in something you cannot see with absolute assurance that it's real. All right? And faith is the, I told you, it's faith that moves us into every aspect of our spiritual uh, lives. I, I mean, I told you a person is saved by faith. Without faith, you can't get saved. Amen? And without faith, you can't get saved. It's impossible. One, I mean, you have to understand that for a person to get saved, a person has to call on the name of Jesus. A person has to believe that Jesus Christ, and listen, that Jesus is God. He died for our sin, was buried, and got up from the dead. I told you last time we met, you know what I told you? It's hard enough just to believe in God, right? It's hard enough just to believe in God. Now, it's not that we don't have evidence of God. This is what Romans chapter 1, verse 20 is talking about. I mean, there's no person ever going to say, hey, listen, Ain't no person ever going to stand before God and look at him and give an excuse. There's no way, the Bible says, there's no man without excuse. There's no way that you can't know that there is a God, a creator God. I don't care what they teach you at school. I don't care what you read or what you see on Discovery Channel. I want you to know there is one God. His name is Jesus Christ. He's sitting on the throne. He spun everything. He spoke everything into existence and spun everything into orbit. There's only one God, and he holds it all together. And none of this, when you walk outside, none of this happened by accident. It didn't happen by happenstance. Y'all listening to me? So don't get to it today. If you don't get saved, you won't be able to use the excuse, I didn't know there was a God. All you got to do is walk outside. Who you think did all that? Who you think did it all? It's no accident that the sun comes up every day and it goes down. The moon rises every night and the stars shine every night. I mean, you can count on it like clockwork. Never going to change. It may be dim one day because the clouds. 
But the sun's still rising and the moon's still rising. The sun's still setting. The moon's still setting. The stars still shine. I want you to understand it will happen as long as everything remains in existence. God is holding it all together, and you can trust that there is a God. That doesn't happen by accident. That's not even my sermon. I'm throwing all that in for free. I just want you to understand, be aware of that, okay? But it takes faith to believe that, does it not? Believing in something you cannot see. I mean, God, it takes faith. But much less, think about this. How much faith does it take to believe that God not only did all this out here, but think what he did for you. Think what he did for you personally. Because you're a sinner, all right? You're a sinner. Let me stop pointing. But, I mean, we're all saying we can all point. You know what I'm saying? Because we're all saying. I know some of the guests looking at, and y'all bumping elbows saying, what you telling about me before I got here? Plenty, plenty. <laughs> but we're all sinners, the Bible said, and sinners in need of a Savior. Y'all follow me right here? So it's a, a, important to understand that. But think about this, what Jesus did for you. God in human skin, he was born into his own creation, lived a sinless life, laid down his life on an old rugged cross, s spilt his precious sliced blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And Jesus took his, your sin upon him at the cross of Calvary, died as a perfect sacrifice that he would accept and then he got up from the dead showing his power over your sin showing his power over hell showing power over the grave but think about this now think about this it takes a lot of faith to believe that Jesus died and got up from the dead you ain't never seen nobody get up from the dead and if you have I don't want to know about it you know what I'm saying? I mean, we ain't, let's be real. You've never seen, now, again, we've seen things, miracles happen in the hospital, whatever, but you ain't never seen them down there at Austin and Bell and get up out the casket. It takes faith to believe that they can do that. Wait till next week's sermon when we talk about Lazarus. Been up in the tomb for four days. The Bible said in the King James, he stinketh. <laughs> He'd been in there so long, he started to stink. I mean, it got up. So here, here's, here's, don't miss this. It takes faith. Faith to believe in something that you've never seen, but to believe that it's absolutely true. But here's one thing I want you to ask. When we get saved, when we exercise the faith that God has given to us for him, okay, I want you to understand there's some great benefit. When you get saved, and you, I mean, some great men, not only you get a brand new heart, brand new star to get a reservation in heaven, let, let, let me tell you, one of the greatest assets to a child of God is the fact that you have an unlimited, uh, unlimited supply of God's power in your life. The same power raised Jesus from the dead. Same power that spoke everything into, is available for you to use in your life and in your life's situation. Oh, this is incredible. This is incredible. But in order for us to really understand and how we can tap into that resource, we got to understand, listen, that it takes faith, but a, a special kind of faith, a little unique faith, if you will. And that's what I want to talk about in Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, going down to verse 12. Stand, if you would, for the reading of the Word of God. Now listen to me. I'm going to give you today one primary discovery. One primary discovery of how God supernaturally works in our life. One primary, I got one sermon point today. Now you can already attest by the 8 o'clock service, my sermon not going to be any shorter. But I ain't got but one point today. All right? But you're going to have to hang in here. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, look at me. Let's make no bones about it today. Most of you in here are not going to like my sermon today. You're not going to like what the Word of God. The Word of God, you know what it says over in Ecclesiastes? There's a time to tear down and a time to build up. My prayer today is both happen. But I want you to understand that most of you in here are not going to like what, what I'm preaching today. It's going to hurt. It's going to sting. 
It's going to affect most of them. Hey, understand, I've had to deal with it for a week. You only get it for 15, 20, 30 minutes out here on Sunday morning, however long I preach. But I got to deal with it all, all week. That was a hyperbole. I know I probably preach a little longer than that. But you're not going to lie. But I'm, let me tell you what I'm going to do right now. All right? And, hey, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we may go a little long today. I'm going to take as long as the Lord leads. I'm not going to apologize for it. We're going to preach the word of God and let the chips fall where they may. But before we do that, here's what I'm going to do. If there's anybody who needs to leave, go ahead now. Because I'm telling you right now, you're not going to like the sermon. You're going to get mad at me today. You're going to get mad at the Lord today. But now's your pass. I'm giving you a free pass. If you don't want to stay here a little long today, I'm not, I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm just saying, I got, a, I got a sneaky suspicion we're going to be here. We're going to do the invitation. The invitation today is going to be absolutely pandemonium. You know why? Because many of you are going to be down here. Hey, listen, you know what we're going to do at the invitation? We're going to use these. I'll let your imagination run wild. But, if you're not up for it today, then now's your ticket. You got to go. Because God going to change some lives in here today. And some of y'all going to get saved today. And some of you, some of you going to get baptized today. I mean, straight up in your clothes today. I mean, straight up. You don't literally have to do that. We got robes and stuff we'll give you, but you're going to at the end of the service. And wait. I love y'all back here, but the air conditioning's not working. If you think it's hot now, get ready to get hotter. <laughs> but I love you. I won't think any less of you. I promise you this because I love you as your pastor. I won't think any less of you if you walk right out that back door. Come back next Sunday. Come back Wednesday night, okay? But this is going to be rough. Are you ready? Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to give you one primary discovery of how to tap into the resource, the supernatural power of Almighty God. The Bible says in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, When Jesus had returned to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that Jesus was back at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not, e not, not even near the door. Have y'all ever read this before? Huh? Hopefully you went to Sunday school and then went to Sunday school. Have you ever read this before? Oh, I'm telling you, so much we could preach right here today. I mean, so many sermons right here. Think about this right here. Hey, have you ever thought, I mean, we live in a day and time, even at the church. The church is born into this mentality. We're trying to figure out how we're going to drum up a crowd at church. We're trying to drum up how, how we, and you've got all these books written down here about how you get a crowd. I mean, won't you take your tile, Pastor? Won't you get you a coffee table up here and let's do some tabletop chats? Make people feel more comfortable up here. Won't you change the music and make it more like a rock concert than anything else? I mean, there's all kind of ways that we can try to drum up a crowd. But you want me to tell you what the Bible said? If we want to drum up a crowd up in this place, if we want to drum, if we want to crowd, invite Jesus. Because when Jesus comes, there comes the crowd. When Jesus comes. Maybe that's the problem in some churches today. Maybe that's why they don't have a crowd. Maybe they forgot to invite Jesus. He's been invited here. He wants to do something in your life. I want him to work. And Jesus, in this crowded room, the Bible says, was speaking the word to them. And they came to him. They came to Jesus, bringing a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic... See, they weren't Baptists. 
because that they've got there in the crowd and there just wasn't room for them to get in. You know what we do as Baptists? We just go home. We just figure if we drive through the parking lot and we don't have a parking place, rather than just park in the grassy knoll, what we'll do, we'll just go home because obviously they didn't want us to come today. We give up too easy. They wasn't giving up. They were desperate. They were going to do whatever they had to do to get this man, to get their situation in the presence of Almighty God. And Jesus, seeing their faith. <laughs> y'all just ain't having as good a time as I am. Have y'all ever read this passage of Scripture? And Jesus, the Bible says, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes <laughs> were sitting there and reasoning in their heart. Why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? <laughs> that was the point. <laughs> Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves. Hey, make no, never mind. Make no mistake about it. Jesus knows exactly what's up in your heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. He knew exactly what they were thinking in their hearts. So he said, which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so you, did you know that the Son of Man is Almighty God. To know that I'm not blaspheming, to know that I've got the authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up, picked up his pallet, and went home out in the sight of everyone, so that all were amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we ain't ever seen anything like this. Whew, I pray that happens here this morning. Oh, I pray when you get over to the restaurant. I pray, whoo, we ain't ever seen nothing like, what's the matter with these people? But they've been changed by the power and the presence and provision of Almighty God. <laughs> Father, help us to know how to tap in this power. Save somebody. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can I ask a question while you're being seated? Anybody in here praying about God to do something in your life? Is there anybody in here? Let me see a show of hands. Well, you've been praying about something in your life, something that only God can do, and you've been asking him to do it. Hold your hand up. Let me see your hand. All across the auditorium, good. It's a good thing you came today because I'm going to tell you how to get, uh, how to allow God to move in your situation. You've been praying about something, either for yourself or somebody else. you got a situation that you're trying to get before Jesus and tap into the supernatural power of God, we're the first primary discovery that we see of how the Lord works supernaturally in our life is the fact that Jesus responds in our life. Jesus responds in our life situations. Jesus responds when he sees our faith. Jesus responds by seeing faith. The Bible says, and they came, bringing to him, bringing to Jesus a paralytic carried by four Men, being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they, saw, when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I want you to know this is probably one of the most incredible passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. It's one of my favorites in all the Bible, just like all the other verses in the Bible, all the other books. I mean, they're all my favorite, but I'm telling you because they're life changing. I mean, think about them. Now, Jesus is back home in Capernaum. Now, most scholars believe, and I do too, even though I'm not a scholar, but most people believe that this is Peter and Andrew's home. It's really his home base, not his personal residence where he grew up. It's his home base. He's back home, and when he gets there, the crowd shows up because they heard Jesus is back in town, all right? So then the crowd shows up, but the story moves on. Now, Tim, follow me right here. The story moves on to talk about five men who were extraordinary men. 
five men who obviously here, who obviously had had an experience and an encounter with Jesus at some point in their life because they go to extraordinary measures, Miss Donna. They go, I mean, to, to, I mean, they know. It's obvious that they have experienced at some point, sometime, they knew who Jesus was and what Jesus had the power to do. I mean, we find these men. These men are men of faith. These men are men of faith that is a little unique and a, 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 a little different than just a regular ordinary faith, the faith that God has given. This faith has developed. Not only do these men, these men have what, we, what I'm calling today seeing faith. See, they had a different kind of faith. They had the kind of faith that didn't just reside upon the inside. It spilt out on the outside. I mean, they got some seeing faith, the kind of faith that, that everybody up in the church that day, everybody in the crowd that day, that, I mean, it's the kind of faith that everybody, most importantly, most especially, and most pointedly, it's the kind of faith that Jesus himself saw. It's seeing faith. James, the brother of Jesus, called it over in James chapter 2, verse 22. He called it perfected faith. When our faith gets in and works with our work, when our faith gets in and works with our actions, when our faith moves us into action. Friend, I want you to know, look at me and don't miss this point. Look at me and don't miss this point. I want you to know, if you want to tap into the resource of the supernatural power of Almighty God to work in your life and in your situation, it's going to take you moving and developing in your life Seeing faith, the kind of faith that God seeks in your life. Mm -hmm. You see, when our faith starts working up in our actions and moves us, starts moving from the inside to the outside, oh, when God sees our faith move, when our faith moves us into action, God sees it, and guess what it does? It moves God into action on our behalf. Now, now, don't make no mistake. This ain't no formula I'm giving you right here. I'm just preaching the Bible. I'm telling you how God worked then, and I believe God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still works the same way. We've got to have seeing faith. I believe these men had seeing faith. But we have to understand the foundation of seeing faith is saving faith. I believe that these men, when we look at it now, and don't get confused because so oftentimes when we read this passage of scripture, we may, we may have a bit of theological confusion and I want to clear that up for you today. Make no mistake about it. I believe all five of these men were saved, right? You say, well, pastor, that's obvious. He looked at the paralytic and said, son, your sins are forgiven. So the paralytic was saved. Now, I believe all five of them were saved, and I believe they were saved long before they got to Peter and Andrew's house. You say, well, pastor, how, how, how you know? Well, a couple of things. One, we often get confused, right? Because the Bible says they lowered the paralytic down, right? Y'all follow me? Stand up. Everybody stand up. Stand up. Now sit back down. I didn't want to make sure y'all listening to me this morning, okay? Y'all needed that too, didn't you? Some of you are drifting off, you know. I'll call on you to pray if you go to sleep. Now here, 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 here. You ready? Now don't miss this. Don't miss this. Because we look at it and say, well, you know, they lowered them down. Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven. But I believe, all right, and I've come to the theological, that's not when that man got saved. You say, well, how do you know that? Because that's not how we get saved. <laughs> I mean, just because you get in the presence of God doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you get in his presence doesn't mean he says, son or daughter, your sins are forgiven. No, just because you showed up at church this morning doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you, I mean, God is here, but just because you're in your presence, in his presence doesn't mean you're saved. It takes a personal commitment and a, hey, look, a personal confession. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord. You ever called somebody before? I mean, you got to use your mouth. You got to use your voice. I mean, it takes personal dialogue. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's how a person gets saved. We have no dialogue between the paralytic or these four men and Jesus. 
Now, could there have been dialogue? It wasn't recorded yet, but I contend to say, all right, well, we know theologically how a person gets saved, all right? And it wasn't, you said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, because some of you look at it and say, well, Pastor, why did you say that then? I'm going to preach that too. But you know why he said what I believe? He got them Pharisees all stirred up. I mean, Jesus stirring it up. He knew. And here, right, you know why he made that statement? To throw down the gauntlet, to tell those Pharisees exactly who he was. He, he didn't, son, your sins are forgiven. He knew what he would do in their heart. Boy, they got the, I mean, they got the stirred up in there thinking, boy, blaspheming. I mean, who can forgive sins but God alone? That was his whole point in saying it. But I believe he made a declaration in that paralytic's life, a declaration of his salvation that had already occurred long before you get there. You say, well, Pastor, I mean, however, think about this. Have you ever looked at the story? Now, if you want to know why I believe these men were saved before they got there, have you ever read the story? I mean, really read it. I mean, think about this. You got four men who obviously had a friend, somebody that they cared about, somebody who consented to this. So this is why I believe they're all of faith, right? Four men that take a grown man who's a paralytic, which means he can't help. I mean, they've got to get him from one point to the other. They, four men now. Oh, they put him on a gurney. They put him on a pallet. I mean, it's not even a stable one. It's not like how the medical professionals use. I mean, it's just a big blanket. You know, it's all they got. They didn't have that modern technology we got today. So they pick him up. You got, I don't know how it worked, but probably the most simple logistics of this, you got one on each corner of the pallet. Now, y'all listening? Are y'all following me on this? Because I'm going somewhere important. And four men picking up the pallet by each corner, right? And they're carrying a grown man, paralytic, from wherever he was down the street to wherever Jesus was. Y'all ever carried a grown man? I don't know grown man. I mean, let's just assume, you know, he'd probably anywhere from 100 to, well, he'd be a real small grown man if he was 100 pounds. <laughs> well, I mean, think about it, 150, 200 pounds, I don't know. They're carrying them down the street, right? Then they get there. This thing ain't going to be as easy as they thought, you know what? Because they get down there. And I don't think y'all listening. They get down there, and the crowd's so big they can't even get in the room. But they would not be discouraged. They would not be discouraged. So you know what they did? They trying to find a way. So the Bible said they climbed up on the roof. Have y'all ever been up on the roof? I mean, it's hard to get up there. It's dangerous up there. Y'all with me? Scary when you get up there. But here they got, and not only did they get up on the roof, y'all know what they did? They brought the paralytic who could not help. It ain't like he's climbing. I mean, he, there ain't no help. There's no help. And they're carrying the paralytic up on the roof, up on the pallet. And then they get up on the roof. You know what happened? They get up there and they forgot, all right? Lo and behold, they forgot their roof digging into tools. They did not know that they was going to have to cut into the roof, right? So how did they get in the roof? How did they dig in the roof at least a five and a half foot hole so they could lower the man down? They had to start digging in the back. Have you ever thought the great lengths they went to? Ladies and gentlemen, I contend that these men would stop at nothing to get this man in front of Jesus, to get their situation because they knew that Jesus could do it. They believed by faith that Jesus could do it. And it's that kind of faith that stems from a faith when you know what Jesus can do physically. It's because you've already experienced what he can do spiritually. I believe these men had given their life to Jesus. And as a result of that, they were doing everything necessary. They were going to the great lengths to get their situation in front of Almighty God. If we want God to work supernaturally in our life, if we want him to work supernaturally in our situation, situation we too hey ladies, ladies and gentlemen we too we got to have the seeing faith we got to kind of have the faith that moves from the inside spills out and starts moving into our actions and and then causes us to do whatever's necessary to get our situation in front of almighty god oh i wonder what kind of situation now don't tell me 
Well, we've been talking about this thing, right? We've been walking through this thing. I asked you, all right, who, who's been praying about something in their life? All y'all raised your hand. Some of you raised your hand. You thought we was voting for something. <laughs> See, you better listen around here. I wonder what kind of situation you're in. I mean, what, what is it that you've been praying about? Do you want God to work in your marriage? Is that what it is? Your marriage hanging on by a thread? I mean, just, I mean, it's just it. This ain't about to fall apart. Maybe you need God to work in your job situation. I mean, that's just, just terrible. Trying to find you a new job, trying to make, I mean, maybe you're asking God. Maybe you Maybe you're asking God to work in your family situation. I mean, maybe kids run rubshod right now, whatever. I mean, maybe you're asking God to work in, in, in another Hey, Maybe you're asking God to work in a financial situation. Hey. Hey. Hey, you know, I'm teaching a class. Me and Miss Lynn are teaching a class on Wednesday night called Marriage and Money, right? And as I study for this class, you know what I figured out. You know what I figured out, Ricky? That most people in this world, most people in America, in financial trouble. It's amazing to me. I don't read the statistics. You know, think about this. So, if statistics are true, and it's no different inside the church than it is outside, all right? But think about this. 88% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. In other words, like if you missed a week of work, you would suffer direly financially. Hey, most Americans, 88% of Americans have less than $1,000 in the bank stored up for emergencies or future purchases. I mean, think about that now. I'm just listening. Just listen to me now. Most Americans, 88% of Americans carry an average credit card balance, unsecured debt of $8,832. Some of you wish yours was that low. But that's the average. If that's the case, I mean, I think y'all beat the statistics over here at Grace Baptist, right? I don't think, but if that's the case, theoretically, that would be 88% of y'all, that that's really what you're praying about because that thing is so, I mean, maybe, that, maybe that's the situation. I mean, just absolute, that thing is ravaging your life. It's a, you won't know why your marriage is crumbling. I mean, this thing is absolutely tearing your marriage apart, tearing your family apart, tearing your job apart. And you know what's at worst? You know what's so terrible? Getting up and going to a work because you have to, not because you want to. I'll tell you what, if we could get a different perspective on money, we'd probably go to work a little differently, wouldn't we? It probably wouldn't be so bad when we got over there. And that boss is probably not a big a jerk as you think he is. Especially at Grace Baptist for the staff. <laughs> but I mean, I'm just saying, maybe, hey, maybe things would be different if we got, but if that's the case, hey, Maybe that's what you're praying for, God to work. And this principle applies to anything. Your marriage, I mean, maybe, maybe you want to lose some weight, whatever you can apply, but, but maybe we walk through how, how it applies financially. We got time to do that this morning? Because maybe you're in a financial crisis. This is where you've been praying that God would move supernaturally in your life. Well, you know what you got to do if you want God to move in it? You got to have seeing faith. One, you got to have faith. You got to have saving faith. If you want God to help you, you better get on his team. You better get, he helps his children. He's not going to give his resources, all right? He's going to help his children. So that's where it starts, by getting saved and getting on team Jesus. But then your saving faith's got to develop into seeing faith. And God has got to see what you're doing. Not only while you ask him for his help, he's then examining what you're doing. Can he see you? What are you doing? Say in your financial crisis, you know what we got to do? We got to have seeing faith. We gotta, if we're in a crisis, you know what the first step we ought to do? Y'all with me? Get your pens out. You know what we ought to do? We ought to evaluate how we got into crisis to begin with. We ought to evaluate what the crisis is and then how we got there. You said, well, the crisis is I can't, I can't pay my bills. <laughs> I can't, I can't, well, all right, what kind of bills you got? Well, I got the normal kind. I got to do like everybody else has. 
I got the normal kind. Well, what kind, what kind do you got? Well, you know, I got the house payment, rent, whatever. I got, I got the utilities. I got the groceries. I got the gas. I mean, I got the normal kind, just like everybody else. I got the credit card. I got the car payment. I got, you know, I, I, got, I got the student loan. I got the home. I mean, I just got the normal like everybody. Hey, hey. I think we've got our finger on something this morning. Mm -hmm. See, we're in a crisis because we got the normal bills that everybody else has. Because you know everybody got a car payment. I mean, you're going to have a car payment your whole life. You see, that's what, that's what, that's what the world will tell you. See, when we begin to think things are normal... When we have bought stuff that we don't need with money we do not have, that is not normal. That's normal for the world out here. That's normal, but that is not normal for God's people. That's no, not normal. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the borrower is slave to the lender. When we go out here and buy things, and purchase things with money we don't have, and the devil is readily there to provide everything that you need and the means to buy it. All this debt out here has destroyed the American family, all because we want what our grandparents had. They worked all their life to get it, and we want it now. And the devil said, you want it? I'll give it to you. And we said, okay, hook line and sinker. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to get out of the crisis, we got to figure out how we got in the crisis. And then we got to modify some behavior. You can't, listen, the definition of insanity is getting up doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You can't, you can't pray about God. Would you fix, would you send some supernatural provision? Would you send some supernatural money into my bank account? And I promise you he can do it. I promise you by the authority of the word of God. He makes trees on the weekend. He can supply the income, amen? But I want you to know, you cannot ask God. You cannot ask God for a supernatural provision if you haven't even been a good manager of the natural provision he's already given you. If you don't know how to spend it, how do you expect them to give you more? You got to change something. So how do we do my behavior modification? I'm glad y'all came today. How do we do that? And I'm going to help you on Wednesday night. Some of y'all ain't been, come on. Me and Ms. Lynn, we're going to teach you how to get out of debt. We're going to teach you how to move forward on this. You want some extra help. I'm going to help you right now. Behavior modification. First thing we got to do, we got to stop, the, we got to apply the tourniquet to the problem. You didn't bring, today, you need to get rid of them credit cards. It's the devil's means. You better get rid of them credit cards and debit cards. Well, pass that debit card. No, I'm going to tell you something. When you spend on debit cards, you spend 18% more than you would if you used cash. I'm telling you, it's a crock. The devil is a liar. He's the father of lies. And he's brought you in this financial crisis and it's crippled everything about your life. We're going to have to stop. We're going to have to stop the bleeding. We've got to apply the tourniquet. So get rid of the source of what's brought you in the crisis. And let me tell you something else. We've got to learn how to control our money. We've got to learn how to get in control of our finances. We've got to learn how to tell our money what to do instead of our money telling us what to do. You better get a budget. First thing you ought to do, go home and write out a budget this afternoon if you're in the fight. Write out a budget. Don't put one cockamamie budget up in your skull, up here in your mind, and think that's going to work. You better get a pen and piece of paper out and write it down. How much money you make, how much outcome you got, and you better make the two balance. Uh-oh, Craig Lee is going to be busy today. You better get a budget. There's no way you'll ever experience financial freedom without a budget. 
and you guiding and controlling and telling your money what to do and let's stop letting it tell you what to do. Drives me absolutely bananas. I'll sit down with people having difficulty in their marriage. First thing I do, go to the, I, I just go to checkbook. You know why? Because I can figure out what's the matter with the marriage. You, I mean, somebody come in marriage counseling, hear what I ask. Uh, I ask them about their financial situation. Well, how much money do you make? Of course, they're a little baffled that I'm asking the question, but nevertheless, I just, I just won't know. I didn't prepare them beforehand. How much money you make? You know what happened, Troy? This was a, well, I mean, she does pretty good. Now, honey, you, you did pretty good last month. Tell him how much you make. And then I said, well, how much you make? Baby, tell him I do pretty good. Tell him, tell him. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just, I mean, we don't even have an idea what's going on inside the house. We ain't got no budget. We got no plan. We got nothing. And we want to know why our lives are financially devastated. Modifying behavior. Hey, is God seeing your faith and the action you're taking to modify the behavior? That's when it gets in supernaturally. That's when all of a sudden something shows up in the mailbox you wasn't expecting. That's when all of a sudden something shows up in the bank account you wasn't expecting when God sees you moving by faith. Not just sitting around waiting, oh, Lord, I need your help, and you're doing nothing to modify the behavior. Oh, what about what about praying? How's God seeing your prayer life change? Seeing by faith your prayer life change? Is he seeing that? I mean, has he seen you start praying for contentment in your life? Because the only reason you went out here and bought all this stuff because you wasn't happy with what God has already given you. And you wanted what everybody else had. Because you, it was your right. Because I'm American. And I'm going to live the American dream. And the devil's going to finance it for you. Destroy your marriage. Destroy your family. Is that boat worth it? Is that car worth it? Everybody got a car, but I don't. you stop trying to buy what everybody down the street's got? Learn how to be content with what God has given you. Instead of wanting and wanting and wanting. Because the enemy will provide, provide, provide. And then it will destroy, destroy, destroy. Pray for contentment. Paul said that godliness is actually a means of great gain if accompanied by contentment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. You want great gain in your life? Get content. And let God do it instead of you trying to do it. Hey, let God do it instead of Satan. What about your faithfulness? Your actions? He's seen your actions. He's seen your faith on the outside. What about when that offering plate comes? Uh-oh. What about when this comes? Hey, let me make this clear. I'm going to tell you this, but it's not for the benefit of the church. You understand me? It's not for the benefit of your pastor. I'm telling you for your own benefit. We're doing just fine as a church. I'm not telling you so you'll put some more money in the plate. We're doing just fine without, without it. You're not putting it in yet. We still ain't shut down the doors or shut down any ministries. I'm thankful for the faithful, 11% who actually give 10% of their income every week, every month in order to fund and fuel the ministry. I'm grateful and I'm praying for the other 22% of tippers. We got 11% tithers, 22% tippers, 67% of y'all don't even give one red dime. I'm not telling you this so you'll put some money in the offering plate. Obviously, we're doing just fine without it. I'm telling you for your own benefit. 
How in the world are, can you expect God to supernaturally work in your life if you don't even recognize where the source of blessing comes from, where the source of income comes from? When you've not chosen the God, he said, choose today. He said, you can't serve two masters. You'll either serve me or you'll serve money. How is he going to bless you when you said, I'm going to serve all the other gods? Starts with 10%. And that's just the rudiment basement level. Most time we think if we ever get to 10%, boy, we've made it. No, that's the starting point. But friends, I, let me ask you this. If you're not even trying, if you're not even trying, how do you expect the God, now how do you expect God to get in on your finances if you're not even trying? Again, I'm not telling you because we need more money at church. I'm telling you because I want God to supernaturally work in your life. I'm even offering, God is offering his supernatural help. I'm offering my, my I, I'm, I'm, I told you come to my class on Wednesday night. I teach you how to get out of debt. I'm going to help you. I'm your pastor. But God got to see your faith. If you want God to supernaturally move in your life, then it starts with seeing faith. It starts with saving faith, but saving faith that develops into seeing faith. You know what the Bible says? Jesus, seeing their faith, looked at the paralytic, and he got involved in that difficult situation. If you want him involved in your difficult situation, he got to see your faith. Father, help us now. Now's the time for us to respond this morning. Father, help them to understand as we examine finances or any other difficult situation in our life, it's not about money. It's not about, it's about how you want to work. And God, I pray that you bring us the choice today. Everybody in here is praying to you about something. They raised their hand and said they are. And God, I pray that you would respond today to them. But, Lord, we know that you respond by seeing faith. Move on us in Jesus' name. Amen.